Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, gosh, it feels like afternoon already for me. Um, <laughs> good morning. Uh, I'm Courtney Cogburn. I'm actually, I'm actually an associate professor now at Columbia School of Social Work. So I'm quickly, thanks, thanks. So I'm going to quickly lob some things at you. I don't have time to elaborate, but hopefully it's food for thought uh, for you to consider as we move forward. So I am the lead creator, along with the team at Stanford University, of A Thousand Cut Journey, which puts you into the shoes of a black male as a child and adolescent and as an adult who's experiencing racism in different forms across different contexts. And we were interested in whether going through an experience like this may be the sort of gut punch that certain people need to really grapple with the realities of, of racism. And as a psychologist, um, we're doing several studies to, to try and assess the effects of this. Not really talking about that today, but wanted to give you some context. I want to talk about why VR and the association with empathy is really an insufficient approach, especially when we're talking about race and racism. It's not just about feeling bad. It's also not just about your individual levels of unconscious bias which seems to be very po popular for people to talk about. We've lobbed onto that. Unconscious bias is important, but again, it's wholly insufficient for motivi motivating social change. Social change comes from action, not just being aware of your bias and not just feeling bad about the problem. So can VR promote anti-racism is a question that we were focused on in our work. Um, and I like this quote from a fellow psychologist, uh, Fia Salter, who says, rather than attempt to control expression of culturally constituted individual bias, a more effectual use of personal agency may be to reconstruct worlds that promote anti-racist tendencies. So what are some of the roadblocks that I perceive to um, more of us actually being anti-racist? So one, we avoid racism. It makes people feel icky. Probably when you saw that first slide, you got a little funny feeling in your stomach, like, oh no, we're going to talk about racism. Um, <laughs> what I would argue is that colorblindness, is, color blindness, not paying attention to race, is actually not a solution. It's a form of racism. So ignoring the realities of race and the ways in which we have a racially structured society and the ways that it impacts outcomes um, in our society um, is a form of racism. Uh, two, people don't understand what racism is. We think racism is bias. Bias is not racism. Racism is a very complicated system that's integrated into our systems and structures and policies in ways that far uh, exceed uh, what an individual is capable of, of doing. Focusing on your individual designation as being racist or not. This is a big one. People are really consumed with the idea of being designated as racist or not. If I could hand out stickers to all of you and told you that you were racist or not racist, that would not be enough to do the job, right? I would argue that that's even a little bit narcissistic, this idea that, phew, so as long as you don't think I'm racist, as long as you think I'm a good person, then it's all good. That's not the same thing as being anti-racist. That's not the same thing as working toward racial equity. And again, I would argue that anti-racism is more something that's grounded in behavior and policy and not just your uh, self-consumed uh, self-definitions. Uh, focusing on individuals rather than systems. So again, focusing on individual bias as opposed to systems of bias. Focusing on, um, again, your individual designation as opposed to thinking the ways in which policies and systems uh, promote uh, structural inequalities. And so what I would argue that we need to focus on structural competence more than cultural competence. Not to suggest that cultural competence is not important, but do we have an understanding of the ways in which policies and structures and systems have helped get us to where we are today around issues of race. Do you have competence around that, not just understanding the cultural differences across different groups? Diversity won't fix racism. <clears throat> this is not about the color that's sprinkled in the room. And sprinkling color in the room, as some of you who have worked in the space know, is not enough to keep people there and doesn't really rely on the question of why is there a lack of color in this room? Why is there a lack of color in other rooms that we're in? What are the reasons for that? It's not just interests. It's not just uh, um, who signed up first, right? There's lots of other issues at play that we need to be thinking about and considering deliberately. So I would argue that I don't need you to like me. I need you to hate racism. It's not about our friendships. It's not about happy hour, although happy hour is great. We can go right after this if you want. Um, <laughs> it's not just about the interpersonal dynamics. It's about are we creating cultures and systems and policies that are actively anti-racist? And I would argue that racism is so firmly embedded into our culture and society that if it's not anti-racist, it's probably racist. Equality is not possible without an active anti-racist, anti-oppressive intention, analysis, and action in everything that we're doing. 
And without an anti-racist and anti-oppressive intention analysis and action, emerging technologies will rapidly exacerbate existing social inequalities by race and other issues. Thank you. Thank you.